they're totally sponsoring these uh, these sessions. So thank you very much. Shelly Martin back here is our key contact, key person for this. Thank you, Shelly. Appreciate it. Appreciate all your all of you taking time to come tonight. Um, we have four sessions this year, and the, actually the Tonight will be, be developers talking about their projects. We really wanted to go local as much as possible um, with uh, with the series this fall, and so three of our sessions will be local. We have the developers talking about their projects. Next week is our one non-local presentation. That will be Jonathan Heller. He's from Seattle, and um, he's with Ecotope, and they did an incredible design on a fire station. So we have a case study on HVAC systems, um, highly efficient H HVAC systems. And so I think you're going to be, um, I hope you come back, because I think you, you'll enjoy uh, learning what they did and how low the energy footprint is of this fire station. They built four fire stations. Only one was designed by Ecotope, and it cut the energy use by by um, over 50% uh, from the other other fire stations, exact exact stations, and he'll tell you what that's about. And then, um, so that's that's next week. Um, the week after Thursday, whatever that day is, um, I think it's uh, the 23rd or the 30th. 30th. Okay, I was, I was in the 23rd. On October 30th, we're going to have local architectural firms talk about their projects. We have three really good firms, and um, uh, they'll be CTA, CSH, QA, and Hummel, and they'll be talking about projects that they've put together over the uh, the last year, basically. They're pretty pretty new projects, so I'm excited to hear about that. And then for our last session, it's going to be really good, too. It's going to be this guy sitting here. Uh, it's actually uh, Dr. Van in Y. Millenberg. You know, Kevin, thank you. Um, Kevin's going to do uh, really an integrated lighting session, um, both uh, uh, talking about electric light and day, daylighting and the integration of those. Uh, he's got several pieces that he'll talk about, but um, it, it's really good. He promises you haven't heard it before, so come to hear it. This is um, this is new stuff, and as you know, lighting's changing all the time, so it, it's going it, it's a big deal. We want to hear about that. So thank you, Kevin. So a lot of local this year and uh, one uh, one outside Seattle. Tonight we want to focus on the panel that Sharon Grant put together. Um, thank you for doing that. And I'll let Sharon introduce the panel. And uh, thank you all for coming. I appreciate it very, very much. Um, but before we do that, I think the panel might like to know who you are. Uh, so how about we just do a quick introduction, tell us who you are, and um, I, um, just why you're here. Sharon, I'll start with you. Yeah, that's a great idea. Okay. Uh, Sharon Grant, I'll be moderating today's session. I'm Kevin Vandenwein Mellenberg with the University of Idaho Integrated Design Lab. I'm Gunnar Gladix, an architect with Hummel Architects. Uh, Katie Licklider with the U of I Integrated Design Lab as well. Sam Borman, an architect with CTA Architects. Jason Butler with CTA Architects. Steve Benner with CSHQA Architects. Elizabeth Cooper with the Architects Office and the University of Idaho. Dylan Agnes, first year graduate student. Leslie Prendeville, first year. Uh, landscape architecture student. Awesome. Great to have students. Thanks. I'm John Bernardo. I do sustainability here at uh, Idaho Power. Leif Algathan with Site Based Energy. Thank you. Shelly, I said thank you. But... Shelly Martin, Idaho Power. Beth Baird with the City of Boise. Brianna Salazar, I'm just here to learn. <laughs> Miracle Terrace deconstruction. So that's who we have in the room tonight. Um, the panelists get a little better idea of who's here. I hope you could hear that okay. Um, do we know who's online? Amy? Six attendees online here. Why don't you don't have to? Well, yeah, you do have to. Uh, there's uh, Diane. 
uh, Diane Steinbrom, forgive me if I mispronounce any of these names, uh, John Calderon, uh, Jolyn Green, Sandy uh, Ho, and Tim Grissom. Oh, and Don Marie Caldwell. Excellent. Thank you all of you online for being there. And uh, let's get on with the session here. Sharon, would you please come up and moderate this panel? And thank you again for putting it together. Um, and we should mention as well that I believe this video gets posted on the Integrated Design Lab site. So more than just the people that are here today, more than just the people that are online right now, uh, this does get posted, and we, we find that it does get quite a few watches um, once it goes out on, on their website and goes out on video form. So, well, I, I want to introduce today's panel and, and give you an idea of the perspective and how it's different from the others. You know, we really wanted in this particular panel to give the perspective of the owner. And so we aren't necessarily going to have all owners that are at the table today, but they're all going to give the perspective of how do you analyze decisions when you're responsible for the return on investment and what the value is, and also, the, the people at this table were decision makers in some of these processes. And so I want to talk about it from that perspective and make sure that we consider where the value lies. So we are focusing on energy efficiency. Why is it of value to each of these projects? And we also wanted to choose very different types of local projects. So we have a downtown office building, which we'll call a modern building. Is that a fair statement, Kobe? Sure. OK. Um, we have a very historic building, and it was renovated to a different use in a lot of ways. So we wanted to have the perspective of a historic building. And then we've got a hotel that has gone through some major renovations. So we figured it would be good to have different types of commercial properties and have the different perspectives of are you concerned with tenants, are you concerned with historic value, are you concerned with guest experience, and how do you prioritize all these different things with the energy savings. And so those are some of the things that we wanted to address today. And I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to click, hold a microphone, and hold this. OK. So if you want to go ahead and advance. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, so the goal of today was, again, to, to really look at energy efficiency from an owner's perspective and analyzing the value. And you know, I'll go ahead and introduce each of the people on this panel. Um, you may have seen advertised that originally we were going to have uh, Clay Carley on the panel, who owns Old Boise and a lot of old buildings and, and sections of downtown. He had a last minute emergency come up, was not able to make it today. But we are really happy that David Ruby, his architect on the project, was able to make it today. So we've had discussions before this, and we've gone through Clay's perspective. and you know, made sure that we have a really good foundation for the discussion still to, to treat it from an owner's perspective. Um, so again, we're going to look at it from a historic standpoint. How do you balance historic buildings and how you want to make those energy efficient but still preserve that, that integrity? How do you create a sense of place out of it? How do you decide what the best use is for that building? And how do you, again, get that sense of space out of those different uses that you're going to be doing? Um, so. We're going to be talking about that historic value versus the, the cultural integrity. And also, how do you judge really hard decisions? And I'll just be really upfront on how I was involved in some of these projects. And if any of you are familiar here with the kilowatt crackdown competition that went on over the last year, year and a half, um, the, um, the Oahe was involved in that competition in the beginning, at the beginning stages of design and when they started construction. So I was involved in some of those initial discussions of well, how do we decide between preserving this historic feature and do we use LED lighting or not? Do we put this heating and cooling system in? What do we do about this restaurant system and this ventilation system? And so I'm hoping we'll be able to touch on a lot of those things, but it was how do you weigh all those decisions and decide which ones are the priority for how you're going to preserve this historic building? Um, Kobe Barlow is here from Oppenheimer Development Company, and I've worked with Kobe Barlow on the Market Partner Program, which is a program of NIA, the Northwest Energy Efficiency Alliance. He was also involved in the kilowatt crackdown with a number of the buildings that Oppenheimer owns and manages. And Kobe's in charge of pretty much property management in, in all ways, shapes, and forms. And to me, it's been an interesting process to see how he's transformed in the last few years and you know, hopefully I don't embarrass him by saying this, but you know, when we first started out about discussions, to, to hear his perspective of energy efficiency and how that has advanced over the last few years between detailed scoping audits done by the integrated design labs, 
level three ASHRAE audits to analyze these buildings, detailed energy models to really understand the dynamics of every change that you're going to make. And so we want to delve into some of that. How did that help your decision making? How did that strategic process help you gain a better perspective on the value of energy efficiency in the building from a bottom line perspective as the owner of these buildings and the property manager of these buildings? So, and then David uh, Johnson is the owner and developer of the Riverside Hotel. And I'm going to blank on the other hotels. Do you want me to mention a few of those? Okay. Hilton Garden Inn and Eagle. Okay. Okay. Um, so we focused on looking at the Riverside Hotel, which we're going to show you a layout of the building. And if you think of a classic building and envelope, this goes against every classic energy efficiency um, standard we may have and how we want to think about a building. It's a very spread out design. We'll show you a layout of it. Um, but again, what's the perspective of someone who comes into an existing hotel, decides to upgrade the guest experience, but also address some major energy efficiency issues and want to improve those things for the energy savings as well as for the minimizing of maintenance issues. So we're going to focus on the Riverside Hotel today. Um, I think I've covered all these pretty well. Um, so again, we've talked about Kobe. Again, we've got David. Um, David as well. Okay. Um, so really, I wanted to start with with a basic question first of each of the three people on the panel, and then we'll delve into a lot more detailed discussion with with each of you. But I kind of want to just start with this basic question of why was energy efficiency at the forefront of some of your design discussion, and why would is was it important to your project? So I'll start with you, David. Well, I think, um, you know, with Clay, you mentioned Clay does own a number of buildings in downtown, and I think it, it's, a, it's a pretty simple question that means them for long term. And so, or he puts in up front. Okay, I'll try to maybe speak up a little bit. project. You know, he owns a lot of buildings, and he's owned them for a long time, and he has a interest in all of his projects. So. You know, it, it, that's one thing that we didn't have to convince him of is looking long term. So he knew everything he did up front was going to pay itself off one way or the other. Mm -hmm. So okay. that's the simple, the simple answer. It wasn't very complicated. Yeah. So it sounds like you know to sum it up, it wasn't about the decision today. It was thinking long term. What's your long term value if you're going to hold on to a property? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Kobe. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if any of you want to stand up and move, and, I mean, I'll, you're welcome to do that too. This doesn't have to be a sitting panel. Okay. You know, I, I think from our standpoint, um, one of the reasons for for kind of looking at energy as as a priority is. Uh, the, the building market, the office market, you know, that we're mostly involved in is, is really a pretty competitive market. Um, the buildings that we have, you know, I like earlier that you said a modern building. It's it's somewhat a modern building, but you know, the one we're discussing, you know, mainly today was built in 1989. So you're looking at a building that's 25 years old. You're competing with buildings that are 25 years newer, the uh, newer technology, you know, more comfort, and, and just what you lose in a building over 25 years as far as the, the comfort of the building itself, uh, the efficiency of the building itself. And so it brings it to the point where you've got to have you know, a, a good running building that's competitive, that's comfortable. Um, and, and so if you're going to make these updates and make these changes and stay relevant in the market, um, yeah, you know, look, look at energy as part of you know, your, your, your main goal and, and part of every project that you do. And I think that's you know, what really has driven you know, the energy efficiency model kind of to the forefront of what we do. Well, and I think, Kobe, you know, by referring to you as the modern building out of the bunch, um, a lot of times when we have discussions like this, it's about the new, new construction that just went up. And there's a lot of value to that. But I also think there's a lot of existing buildings out there, and there are a lot of buildings that were built in 1910 or 1989. And so capturing those buildings and saying, what do we do with them? And so what I gathered from what you said was about com being competitive. Be absolutely about being, being competitive, being relevant. Yep. Okay. David? 
So the, the Riverside Hotel was built in um, 1969, so that's a good uh, cross mix of, of dates. And uh, what I was alluding to when I said I was going to compare it to our Eagle uh, Hilton Garden Inn is that one was built in 2003, and it's more like what I would call a, a normal hotel in that it's uh, designed around a lobby that has the elevators in it and the rooms kind of are around it. Whereas if we could cheat and go to that slide to show them just um, the sprawled out nature of yeah. the Riverside Hotel over almost 15 yeah. acres versus uh, the Hilton, which is on less than three acres. So it's created a, a, a bunch of uh, exteriors that are out in, in, in the open. And so when we first started our due diligence on it, there you go. Um, when we first started our due diligence on this project, the energy usage was double as a percentage of the sales what the Hilton Garden Inn was. So instead of like three, three and a half percent, it was more in the six percent range. So we we knew we had an issue to deal with. Didn't realize quite the ex extent of it till we got into it. But um, the one thing that the Integrated Design Lab identified for us right up front was that when you look at this from outer space, it looks like a frog. And um, so that stuck with me. That's just the analytics. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see all that, the openings that it has. So why focus on, on energy is we knew we had a problem with it. Um, we can, and, and we, we have our operating expenses as a percentage of sales, right? So we want to increase sales and we want to decrease those, those energy costs. Okay. So it's really about being competitive as well. You know, looking at from a value standpoint, one hotel versus the other, what are your operating expenses? And Right. And mm -hmm. yeah, and not so, we're a little different than other hotels in town, so we really wanted to uh, more so increase the sales as far as not create something that could compete because we can't really compete with the Hilton Garden Inn. We're totally different. Mm -hmm. So it was increase sales in other ways, create amenities, and decrease the operating costs. Okay. So, it's so I think we're going to cover what some of those amenities are that have brought real value from a, a guest experience and, you know, have also brought some energy savings. So we'll hit on a few of those. And so... so I just want to frame the discussion a little bit so we understand what an impact this has. Um, Share of energy consumption by major sector, I'm sure most people here have already seen this. The one thing I want to highlight is up here, if you watch the industrial transportation sectors, the blue and purple line, see how they're both declining in recent years. I was just at the National EVA conference, and they talked a lot about why are those sectors declining? But if you look at residential and commercial, they're not even quite leveling out. They're still increasing. So it's our residential and, energy and commercial building sectors that still have a ways to go and have a lot to address. And that's why existing buildings are so important. And so as a percentage of um, energy consumption, you can see office is 23% of the overall picture. So we did want to include office buildings as a priority because they are one of the, the biggest factors in this whole commercial, excuse me, commercial sector. And if we look at the largest office expense, utilities is typically the largest office expense. So and you've probably seen the graph as well over 30 years. You know, it's these operating costs that really start to, to add up over time, and it's the personnel costs that, that really add up. So wanting to factor in the, the comfort and the different things that affect um, the employee and the guest satisfaction can be really important. So, um, And I just wanted to highlight this for the hotel. And on average, you know, 47,000 hotels spend about um, 2,100 per available room each year on energy. And so that represents about 6%. So you're relatively close to average, even though you, you are not as good as the other property you're looking at, which is a more traditional property. Um, and so what they're recommending is a strategic approach to energy. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that today because I think it's important to be strategic. It's not about making really rash decisions. And most of these projects have been in, in the works for, your, for years. And it's a long-term, gradual process of being strategic about a change here and then the next change and what's the next logical one. So there are ongoing improvements that happen. But you know what they're seeing is that um, it would have having a 10% reduction in energy would have about the same effect as increasing the average, average daily room rate by $0.62 cents, um, and the $1.35 um, 
So I don't know if that translates to you as something that, that's pretty relevant, but if you don't have to push for higher rates and you could save it through energy, it probably helps your hotel to stay more competitive. And that tells me there are a lot of old hotels in this country right there. <laughs> there are a lot of old hotels. Um, so what I want to get to today is that you know it's not just about energy being a, a, a building issue. It really is a business issue. So that's where I want the discussion to go today. And you know, I want to start with Toby. And you're going to see the building downtown that we're focusing on, and Toby does have multiple buildings, but this is the Wells Fargo building, and just for comparison, um, one of the things that Toby's been doing is taking a lot of thermal images of the building, and one of his eye-opening moments through all these audits wasn't just that you look at the equipment, but to really pay attention to all the leakage in the envelope. So there's been a huge effort to seal up the leaks that were in the stairwells and the elevator shafts and, and all the different areas, the exhaust vents and things like that. So Kobe, um, we talked about strategic approach and that being important. So what I want you to say, you know, tell us, how have you used a strategic approach to approach energy savings? And can I share what your savings target is for Wells Fargo? Oh yeah, absolutely. That's so right. Their target is a 50% energy savings on an existing building. Um, yeah, no, Sharon's Sharon, exactly right. Uh, when she when she mentions uh, the exterior of the building, the envelope, you know, I, I've spent you know, years looking at and dreaming about and, and trying to get the ownership to do improvements. And, and it's always mechanical, mechanical, mechanical. And, and mechanical is a huge portion of it. But, um, you know, over the last year or so, it, it was really eye-opening to me uh, with what you could do with the envelope of a building. And I was kind of always of the opinion prior to this that, you know, well, we're stuck with the envelope. You know, you look at window projects and things like that, and all of a sudden you're talking millions and millions of dollars to upgrade these. And so, you know, you, you kind of, you, your focus goes away from the envelope in a hurry um, until you take a look at your, your thermal imaging and you just see, you know, huge areas that you're losing heat out of the building. And, and uh, the first picture that I actually saw uh, that was a thermal image shot was at night. And so this was when all of our mechanical systems were off and you could just see this heat load leaking out of these dampers that we had on the side of the building. And it, it did really change my focus to, oh my goodness, well, you know, if we can keep our energy in or, or keep the heat or cool out, you know, we, it reduces what we need to do, you know, to, to condition the air in either direction. Um, so, you know, thanks to a lot of help from the Integrated Design Lab, uh, we went through and, and figured out that we were probably exhausting, you know, every day more than twice the air out of the building that we should have been, um, and so we did some some serious work to to close off a lot of vents that we didn't need. And we had um, vents at the top of stairwells that were stuck open. Uh, we had vents underneath our elevators that were open, where you know it, it literally you could go up there at 32 degrees and and have a nice barbecue outside of them in the summer. Um, but it it did it changed a lot of my focus to okay. You know, before we do all these building improvements that we had planned, you know, how, how much less can we do size-wise and how much less air can we condition if we can fix some of these problems? Um, and so the facade was, uh, you know, the exterior, the envelope was you know, a huge improvement right off the bat. So is it fair to say that in your approach you kind of started with the, the thing that would be load reduction? You kind of started operational measures, load reduction, then big capital improvements. Is that a fair way to chart the progression? That's how we've done it. It wasn't originally how I focused on it. You know, like I mentioned before, I always had these, you know, new chillers, new equipment in my mind because, you know, that's that's the fun part for me. But yeah, absolutely. Um, we went through and after, you know, doing some of the, the audits of the building found, we had equipment running when it sh shouldn't have been, you know, we program to be off. But that doesn't mean that the control system was listening to us. Um, you know, we found some errors in how it was programmed and the equipment that was running that shouldn't be. And we corrected those items, and, and then we went for the, you know, the kind of the, the next lower hanging fruit, which was, you know, stopping the air from going out. We had bathroom fans that were running around the clock that we put timers on. And some of them were relatively simple fixes, you know, once you recognize what they were. Mm -hmm. And so what were some of the operational changes that you made? I mean, those were kind of changes to... You know, timers are one thing. Then you change some temperature setbacks, and you know, we we over time, you know, you, you get tenants and you get a lot of comfort complaints, um, which I, I think are more of an individual um, preference as opposed to you know what you really should be running your building at. So 
kind of to, to gratify or, or satisfy tenants. You go through and you make all these changes, but you kind of forget about them after a while. And, and then we went through and did, looked at where all our settings were, you know, brought our settings back to where they should be, um, and then, like I said, verified the operations of the equipment, you know, verified that it was on when it said it was going to be on, off when it said it was going to be off, and that it was actually you know, behaving like it should be. And so how critical is it to pay attention to that and not assume your controls are working properly? I mean, we hear about night walks and that they're important. <laughs> You know, talk about what did you do in terms of a night walk and really paying attention to are the controls doing what we think they're doing? It, it was it was eye opening. You know, like 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 I mentioned before, you assume the equipment is going to act like you want it to. <laughs> it doesn't mean that it really is. Um, it, it was it was a big enough eye opener for me that it's actually something that I, I throw on my guys, you know, my maintenance staff quarterly now. To, you know, we have a certain amount of overtime that we kind of do to you know just to. To check on some of these operations, and now, yeah, it's we try to get them out there quarterly to spend at least a couple hours a night walking through and, and making sure that you know the, the equipment is off at, in the evening and that the building temperatures are you know not you know too hot, not too cold, but you know you're you're, you're using your outside air in the evenings and just that you know it, it is it's acting like it's supposed to, not just like you think it is. So. So it sounds like that's pretty critical. What do you think were the measures that you would consider the most low-hanging fruit or the ones that brought you the biggest bang for your buck so far? Um, sealing up the envelope was huge. You know, I, I think that was a significant portion of you know what we've gained at this point. And then, yeah, just just verifying the equipment uh, was the other portion of it. I know we have you know VAV motors that were scheduled to be off based on the air handler being off. Well, the air handler was turning off, but we still had you know, 20 VAV motors per floor, you know, 11 or 12 floors of building running all night. Um, you know, they were scheduled to be off based on, you know, how it was programmed, but, you know, somewhere in the, the, the programming, it, it wasn't you know, running like it was supposed to, and, and so that was a huge, huge gain itself. So those, those two items, I think, were where we gained the most for, for the least amount of money to get there. Okay. And it's, you know, I don't want to gloss over the fact that there's also been some major lighting retrofits. Um, so that's been certainly paid attention to. And so lighting has been a, a big factor. And how have you integrated some of these things into to tenant improvement or tenant guidelines or to involving the tenant? Um, you know, working again with, with you guys, we've redone our lease documents. And, and we actually have some requirements that more of a, a green lease style that um, you know, we require them to have efficient lighting. We require them to, you know, to keep the, the building between certain set points and certain power consumptions. Um, so that's, you know, one of the things we've added into it. But um, just giving recommendations to the tenants as they do, you know, building improvements. Uh, I know, you know, you mentioned before the lighting. Um, you know, the, the building originally, you know, built in 89, had T12s in it. And we went from a, you know, T12 to a T8 lamp, you know, I'm guessing 12 to 15 years ago. Um, and since then, we've gone from a 32 watt to a 25 watt lamp, and we've gone from you know light switches to occupancy sensors. So it's really been um, probably over the last actual 15 years from us to get you know to where we're at now as far as our lighting goes. But you know we're using you know, with all the the new construction and the, the renovations in spaces, we're we're actually you know using daylight harvesting uh, in addition to the occupancy sensor. We're we're using more of a realistic um, amount of light per square foot. Um, so it's it's been a significant amount just in lighting. So what about big capital improvements? I understand you've got a really big capital improvement <laughs> coming up. How did you analyze that, come to some decisions, and make sure that you looked at your best return on investment and how you how you reached some decisions on that? <laughs> I, yeah, I don't know. That's, that's, that's an all-night story, I think. Um, we're kind of in a funny spot with the building where some of the equipment itself is is reaching the age that you know we have to start looking at replacements. Um, you know, I, I like I said, I've I've been wanting to do a chiller project in the buildings because we've got our our small chiller is 250 tons. You know, so what do you do when you want to run just a partial load in the building? Um, you don't have a choice. You know, you you just run the building 250 tons. It's on or it's off. Um, and, and that's kind of originally where I I was diving into this project on that, and then the building has 12 separate air handlers in it. 
Um, and as we started looking into it, we found, well, the air handlers don't have any chilled water control on it. It's 100% chilled water through it all the time. And, and as you know, different buildings have different loads, and so you've, you've got a floor with 120 people on it that you're trying to keep happy, so you crank your chilled water down really cold to keep them happy, and then you've got you know, a partially loaded floor where you're giving them that same amount of cold water, and so you've got one floor freezing, you've got one floor that's hot, and as we started to kind of correct that process, we said, okay, chiller project, so we've got to add the chilled water control to it. Well, now to do that, you know, it's, we've got to add a new control system. So you do, you know, a new control system. Well, now we're going to have a variable amount of flow on our chiller, so we've got to have a variable amount, full amount of flow with our pump. So then you go through that portion of it, and then, you know, along comes Integrated Design Lab to help us out with this, and they said, well, you know, instead of doing, you know, two new chillers at 250 tons, you know, we can help you reduce, you know, the load that the building actually requires and use a smaller chiller. So now, not only do I do a chiller replacement, but I can actually do a smaller, more efficient chiller. I can run less load. I can save more money. And, and from this, you know, one idea of, well, I need a new chiller to fix all my problems, we really did come to an actual integrated, you know, solution with all of our systems. You know, we've, we've you know, reduced lighting, which has reduced heat, you know, we've, um, figured out the ability to control where our, you know, chilled water goes and, and improve our, our control system on the building. And, you know, it really did. It came together as a, a project that, that really made sense. You know, so your equipment that's at life end, you're going to have to do something with it sooner or later anyway. So you can take, you know, the cost of that, your savings, you know, thank Idaho Power every time we, we talk about this because some of the rebates they have. And, and all of a sudden, it's something that, that really makes sense. It makes sense to the owners. It makes sense, you know, for the comfort of the building. And, uh, yeah, it looks like it's something we're actually going to accomplish this entire project in the, in the coming year. Okay. Well, are you able to share, like, how much tonnage you're going to save on this cooler or on this chiller and, you know, maybe, you know, any of the finances of it? And I don't want to put you on the spot too much, but, you know, is there anything you can share on that to give people perspective? You know, the, the whole project, I think, is between maybe five hundred and five hundred and fifty thousand dollars um, and I know that Idaho Power, you know, with all, you know, all the rebates put together could you know, cover you know, approximately a, a third of the project, which you, know, you go to your owner and show them, well, it's a third paid for already. Um, you know, that, that's always a, a good boost for the ownership. It, you know, it helps your return on investment. Um, so yeah, that that was that was huge. Um, what was sorry? What was the second part of the question? Just how much you can share on the savings, whether it's financial or percentage savings or tonnage or um, anything on the on the capital improvements. You, like I said, it's probably about a third of the project. On on the, I I can't remember the exact numbers on the, the ROI for it. I know we figured it would be somewhere around a ten year time frame. Um, you know, I I had to go back and and look, but. I know with the, I think this, the savings we've kind of already realized in power at this point, you know, which is about, what do we figure, 15, 18%, somewhere in there. Um, so we're hoping you know, with these chiller items and then when we get the, the facade, the exterior ceiling finished, um, that's where we were going to get to about the 40 or 50% of our actual energy savings. So. Okay. Um, I think it's fair to mention what a valuable resource the Integrated Design Lab was and you know, the program that's out there to, to be able to help support some of these detailed energy audits and energy modeling for existing buildings. And is there anything else I should say about the program or just contact you guys? Okay. Um, so if you want to click to the next slide, I just wanted to close out Kobe's section by saying this is their energy use. So if you look at most of their changes have happened with this purple line at the bottom in 2014, you can see the energy already coming down. And we haven't even done the major capital improvements yet with this, this project. So, you know, some of the lighting upgrades started, I don't know, three, four years ago. Yeah. So, again, to give you a perspective on timeline, it's, it's not a six-month timeline. You know, it ends up being a, a multi-year process to be quite strategic about it. Um, so you're already seeing good savings. Oh, absolutely. Okay. All right. Well, thanks, Kobe. Um, what I'd like to do is maybe wait till the end to have questions for everybody at once. And so I'll go ahead and, and move on to, to David Ruby and start asking some questions about the Iwaki. And, you know, I just want to start again with that, that idea that it's a major challenge to take a historic landmark and maybe switch to the next slide and show us what it used to look like. 
Um, this is a hotel that was built in 1910. So a historic building and, you know, not only a historic building that's gone through additions and changes and upgrades and changes in use and all sorts of things. By the time you got involved, what, two years ago was about when yeah, all this about started. That. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I just want to you know, gain a little bit of perspective for everybody on how did you approach this renovation and define your priorities? Oh, that's, a, that's a loaded question. Um, <laughs> You know, when Clay first called us about this project, um, you know, it, he had already spent, uh, I think, a significant amount of time kind of visioning what he wanted to do. They had started running numbers. Um, you know, and, and again, I'm, I'll try to give a little bit of a developer's perspective, but I am an architect, so I can only do so much. Um, you know, the, we started thinking, you know, I, we came from the design side as a more of an a, a aesthetic perspective of, you know, let's look at some of the things that are just huge flaws in the building. You know, and luckily in a project like this, you know, the windows were one thing that were a huge target and from both, both perspectives. Um, they had been replaced in the 70s or 60s with some single pane, pane aluminum operable windows, which, you know, you could see just from the stains on the windows, they were leaking badly. Um, without doing any energy tests, um, you know they didn't shut properly. They didn't keep heat heat out. They didn't keep light out. You know, you, there's another image that I often see, um, and maybe some of you have seen it, which has most of these windows on this side with awnings on them, because that's at a kind of a skewed, uh, what is it, kind of an eastern side. So that morning really heats it up. You know, so one of the first things we talked about was replacing the windows. And I think he had kind of had that in mind anyway. You know, and part of that was he was taking some cues to uh, about uh, I think three, three years ago, we re I was involved in a remodel of the old Boise City National Bank. And you know, from the outside, you look at it, and one of the most prominent things you see is the window replacement. Uh, so he, we talked about that early on. Um, not only did it help from an energy standpoint, um, but even uh, Acoustics was a big thing for these urban buildings in the downtown core. You've got big trucks and uh, buses roaring by all the time, and those old windows just let the sound right in, along with the cold and the heat. Um, so replacing the windows was huge. Um, another thing that you know we really wanted to do was to put the operable windows back in, and not just in an awning style that really isn't very useful. But I mean, we actually went to fairly great lengths to find the proportions of those exact windows that we saw in some of these kind of quasi-photographic renderings and matched them exactly. Um, the, you know, the, in, in the, that was an easy sell because aesthetically, you know, luckily we had a project right here in downtown that we could kind of use as a comparison and you looked at it and you could just see how amazing they look when you go back to these, the detail of a single hung window. Um, Interestingly enough, on the bottom piece, what you see here in this image is closer to what we have today. When they are in the 70s, I believe it was, they had taken all that away on that first floor and covered it up with red brick and then put in a bunch of, uh, I guess it was, I think it was um, brown tinted storefront, which was very thin, it leaked, it didn't allow any visibility in. So from a retail perspective, that was a, a really bad idea. That's what, one of the reasons none of the retail on the ground floor worked. Um, but when they originally did some of their budgeting, they weren't sure they could, they didn't, sure what, they didn't know what they were really going to do, to be honest with you. They were actually going to try to kind of modify the first piece of the storefront and put a cap on it. And, you know, it, a project like that, when it's like a, an entire city block, was, I think, a little daunting to kind of try to consider um, how much you can do. Um, thankfully, we found some of these old pictures that, got Clay's um, emotional side going, and he agreed that uh, taking that completely away and just replacing it with a historic storefront was probably a better, better decision financially as well as just from a landmark standpoint. Um, the you know, one thing that jumped to my mind when Kobe was talking about the building is we found some very similar things. The, I think we, you know, it's a heat pump building, and the heat pump was on a motor that ran 24-7, 365. It didn't matter who was in the hotel, which is not really visible in this image, or the office piece, which is really 
most of what you're looking at here, it just ran all the time. It didn't matter. And I think when we got involved with the project, I think maybe half of one floor of the office building was occupied. The rest was vacant and had been for at least three or four years, probably longer. But that thing had been sitting there doing, you know, just like you said, running all the time. And, so, and part of that was another thing that is interesting about what you were talking about was these buildings kind of take on a life of their own. And until someone is intentional about thinking and kind of analyzing them, maybe it's always run that way. And so no one ever thought, should it be running? Is it doing anything? Until you undertake a project or have a goal in mind to start asking some questions. I think that's about we have to do. Or it just goes on and you don't even know what's happening. So it sounds like for both of you it was big about not taking, you know, not making assumptions and not assuming that something ran the way it was supposed to, whether it was controlled that way or supposed to run that way, but really thinking outside the box and going, well, does this make sense? You know, I wish, I don't know about from your side, from, from the design standpoint, especially on an old building like this, um, they're rarely linear. You know, you, you have intentions and you start down that path and, you know, we, I think we kind of had a, a road map for what we thought we were going to do. And as we started getting into the building, especially once we physically started getting into the building, we found some just some serious deferred maintenance issues, um, poor construction techniques from the, the, the years gone by. I mean, one of the, you know, the building when you saw it in that original rendering was a hotel that at some point, I'm not even entirely sure when it was converted to offices, which in our lifetime, that's really what the big chunk has been. But there have been so many remodels and TIs done in that building. We found a vault of drawings, but they still didn't even really begin to tell the story. When you started peeling away the layers, we just found, you know, midnight construction that probably was done without a permit. And, you know, that's where you really have to be, um, the team kind of huddles around the table and says, okay, we thought we had this much money to do this with. That starts to get eaten away by all these necessities, by you know, getting asbestos out of the building or plugging holes or a lot of a lot of things. Um, Can so, you take us down your original roadmap of what at the very beginning were your intentions and what was your vision and what sort of energy efficiency things were on the table? And then my back, my second question after that is what got taken off the table? How did you have to value? You know, I'm not. I don't have a lot of statistics. Um, in general terms, um, our direction was really to, um, to not overlook anything that was obvious. I mean, that sounds simple, but you know, if there, we were in a project like this, especially. I mean, the scope all along was pretty massive. So when you're when you're going into a building that had been so neglected, you know, you don't really have to fight for should we do a lighting conversion or not. I mean, the lights are gone. They're, you know, tenant spaces are vacant. They were designed for spaces that were uh, more akin to a you know 80s office environment, you know all closed in, you know so we, we didn't have a lot of those hurdles to go down, um, you know it, Clay in particular loves the old buildings. And I think I guess if I was going to at least touch on a little bit from a developer standpoint, a building like this and maybe even one like yours to some degree, um, they definitely are a little bit of a labor of love because I, I know for a fact this building was looked at by another developer who ran the numbers. And the number said to tear it down. So Clegg stepped in and, you know, especially with his ties to old Boise and just the love of the town, just didn't want to see that happen. And it took a creative mindset to figure out what to do. And his original, I think he would probably admit if he was here, his original vision, and that, that probably goes to the end result and to how much he was going to spend, was probably quite a bit shorter than what really happened. I mean, you know, when you, if you ever remodeled your bathroom at home, imagine doing it to a couple hundred thousand square feet. It was the same idea. Where do you stop? I mean, once you start tearing things away, like you led to, like you find one thing and you want to fix and then it leads to another. And you know, when you have a building tore apart and you, now you can't even operate it, you can't even occupy it, you have nowhere to go but you got to keep going. And so we had lots of discussions about, you know, we, as one example, lighting's been mentioned a lot. The first lighting package that came out for the building was a typical commercial light package. One of our goals, and this is kind of a fuzzy goal, but it was let's use all LED lighting. It's it's here, it's coming, it's basically getting affordable if it's not already. And so the lighting package was a typical package that you might see in a 
modern commercial building. Unfortunately, by the time we really got to getting numbers on that package, you know, we had found uh, half a million dollars in asbestos removal that nobody knew was there, that didn't show up on any reports. We, we had uh, huge chunks of the budget that were eaten away by plugging holes in the dam, so to speak. And so, unfortunately, a lot of those things had to be um, VE'd, if you want to use the term, down to a lesser quality light fixture in that case because there just wasn't enough money left. Um, one of those, you know, as that discussion went on, you know, because that's, that's a huge impact. You change something today, save 10 bucks a fixture now, but you're looking over the life of a building and it's going to bite you. You know, thankfully, you know, the light fixture, at least the, most of the kinds that we used, it was, a, it was a bulb issue. So it's not like we can't, it's not like a fixture is built in that we can't change them as we go down in the, and we, I guess we have some operations and money coming in from the project, but I mean, I know from my standpoint, that was a huge hit at first because it's just, I knew that when you change to something like that, you're just, it's a double whammy. Not only are you using a less quality light fixture, but now you're introducing all that heat that you have to deal with. So it's, you know, it's an amazing, it was, I think, an amazing eye-opener for a lot of the ownership team to see um, how integrated all of this is. And like you touched on about when you start analyzing a building and really studying it, you know, every little decision affects something else. And, you know, you can't not think about that. Okay. So it sounds like you were able to do the windows you wanted from an efficiency <laughs> standpoint. You weren't able to do the lighting that you wanted. Mm -hmm. Any other things that you want to highlight that either were done that achieved what you wanted or, you know, you wish you could have done or are still to be done? You know, the, the, they, they did bring geothermal in, which is a huge thing for the building. You know, being surrounded by the city system but not on it was kind of mind-boggling. Um, so that was, I was you know, personally satisfying to be able to tie into that. Um, I necessarily wasn't involved in the decision to heat the sidewalks with the geothermal, which <laughs> is not very, I don't know if it's energy efficient, but it's innovative, I guess, if nothing else. Um, from a building stamp maintenance standpoint, it was a liability issue that they were happy to do. Um, the, we, did, we were able to um, replace all the roofs on the buildings and re-insulate them. They were not, they are very poorly insulated to begin with. Um, the, and I think one of the later things was happening, it was just kind of, it was by chance, literally, when I talked about the variable speeds on the pumps, is after we shut things down, for several months, and then when you start firing them back up, you know things that were maybe small problems that were getting glossed over just in their me mechanisms, all of a sudden became big problems when equipment wouldn't work. Now, bigger pipes were bigger, correctly sized, and flow was hitting things, and so that's when the, we found out the pump motor was gone. So, you know, I'd love to say that we planned to study the building and that he had done that, and we found all these little problems. That'd be the better way to do it. Um, we found a lot of them by digging into it. Um, part of that was just bad records. I mean, there was really poor drawings available. I mean, Kobe and I were talking about that. Early, the hist the as-built of a building and kind of really what happens to it. I mean, when you're guessing what's under a floor or what has gone on, and if, if no one keeps good records, it, it really slows down the process of trying to, I think, investigate what really might be happening and how to improve it. We waste a lot of time. You know, we, we made our best guesses on this project. We started the work, found out things were different, and then had to react to that. And so it's exciting from that standpoint that you're always really having to kind of face these, these challenges and evaluate a decision against a priority list and then select. You know, on a big project like this, um, there was a lot of those decisions I mean, that happened every single day. So how much value would there have been for you to maybe have a, a better planning process or a better time frame to have been able to do a full energy model oh, and yeah, put immeasurable. that into practice? And if you were to do it again, what route would you take? Definitely would. Um, to, as an architect standpoint, we would definitely encourage uh, you know, developers or even people planning to buy a building like this to do a much longer due diligence period to just find out as much as you can about the about what really is going on, because um, you're right. If, if until you really know what you're up against, you're you're making a lot of assumptions. And I think probably the older the building is, the further off you're going to be on most of those assumptions. At least 
as we found out in many cases we were. Some of those were just, that's what old buildings do to you, they surprise you. Um, some of them were um, things that we never in a million years thought we'd find. We found uh, you know, in the old hotel there were firewalls that didn't exist, never have. You just don't think things like that are going to happen. You think things are built properly. And so when you have to react and fix things like that, it's, it's a little bit frustrating that you have to divert resources to doing stuff like that when you, know, you wanted to do other things. But that's, I guess that's part of a project, too. You kind of have to react to it and go. Um, so hopefully that gave you a good perspective of, of someone who is dealing with a building that is occupied and trying to make long-term changes on an occupied building with maybe a few tenant changes here and there versus having a building that you take and you just gut and you have to like make every decision in a lot shorter fashion. Yep. Oh yeah, once you empty the building out, there's huge pressure to finish that project and get back online. Well, I think, David, you'll probably give us a, a good perspective of a strategic approach, you know, where, you know, again, it's an occupied building. You didn't shut down the hotel, but you've got a pretty long-term plan for how you're going to make some major improvements there. And so I want to hear a little bit about how you think your approach was strategic to be able to approach these energy savings and maybe what your ultimate target was for energy savings. Sure, sure. And I want to say how pretty those two buildings are. So we're showing yours at night. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, but um, anyway, so yeah, it was great to put together a strategic plan, and I can totally agree with everything that David was saying about, um, you know, we did think we did a lot of a good due diligence. We we cut pipes to make sure they, you know, we didn't have problems with pipes. Cut them in the wrong place, I guess, because sure enough, we, we found things. But um, as a, I, we're going to be long-term owners, very long-term owners. So it was important to work with the Integrated Design Lab and Idaho Power and, and uh, the other members of the team to come up with a, a good long-term plan uh, by, by coming up with staged uh, projects that we can do over time as budgets allow. Um, when we first got into the project, we, we had a business plan that went in the trash in like the first day because we had to just focus on other things. Um, so, but having that plan and knowing um, what ultimately the, the correct load factor is for this uh, building, if we do these certain ten, eight to ten steps, we'll have the right load factor, can have the, have the um, uh, right size of boilers and that sort of thing. And we've actually jumped around to different spots depending on what the uh, biggest bang for the buck is. <laughs> you know, so but we will try to get to all those and eventually be following this uh, plan over time that'll uh, result in a better uh, operating hotel. So what were some of the changes you, you considered your biggest bang for the buck and the early on? Like what have been the initial things that you've done to improve the building and bring about energy savings? And then I'll ask later about what you still hope to do or plan to okay. do. Well we have that uh, a guest, ex guest comfort's a big deal for us. Uh, um, um, Kobe was talking about how you know the, the tenants on a certain floor will will complain and you, you fix it. And so they've typically got five-year leases or something like that. We have uh, one-night leases. And if they don't like it, they post on TripAdvisor. And so it's really uh, an important thing that you can sit in a meeting room and some of these have lower uh, ceilings and you can just be baked by a light. You know, I've noticed this more now that I, I didn't used to notice. But now that we have LEDs, you can actually sit beneath the light and just feel the heat off that light. Some of them with great big high ceilings doesn't, doesn't really matter that much. But um, so guest experience was a huge thing for us. The, the lighting projects we did in our, our, our large ballroom and where we illuminated all the corners and it's so much nicer on the eyes and the control systems that run with that. And so I'd have to say lighting was something that was, was really uh, pretty quick payback for us so it made sense to do first. Mm -hmm. Can you give us any insight on that payback or incentives or the financial motivation to address yeah, lighting the, at that level? Yeah, it was great to have Idaho Power step up and pay for a big part of that. So it, just doing that math, um, we were closer to like 4.2 years on some of them, um, you know, based on estimates, of course. But we have, we have one room we call the Sapphire Room, which was an old disco called Club Max. And it had these great big giant uh, light fixtures that had 88 incandescent bulbs burning in each one. And, and then, of course, it had a disco ball 
spinning there. And so there's 88 and 88, and then like six or of these with like 44 in them. Um, and so, yeah, there's one right there. It had 88 incandescent bulbs. Well, now, thank you, Idaho Power, those are LEDs, and uh, it's not, it doesn't put out the heat. They don't burn out. You know, all the problems of getting in there and lifting up things and replacing them. And, and this room has taken on quite a, a, a nice look, you know, with the LEDs in there. And, and uh, we, it's, a, it's a music listening room, and we have so many uh, local groups using that room. And that's just, uh, that's, that's worked out really well. And, you know, the, the banquet people will be in there cleaning at night, and then they'll leave them on. So if they're going to leave them on, let's leave on LEDs, you know. <laughs> okay. I want to ask you a little bit about envelope issues, because we've talked about that with some of the others. Um, so let's go back to this layout. You have a big envelope. So how did you address this strategically to be able to figure out what changes do you make to the envelope and which ones have a good return on investment? Okay, so the IDL... IDL went and picked about, I think it was six rooms, five or six rooms, put in testing equipment, close fire, firewalls, uh, and did kind of a, a leakage test of the thing. And it was, it was pretty incredible. We're double the, the national average. I think we're 17% of our energy escapes from just holes in the walls. Um, discovered a lot of things uh, and same kind of construction issues that, that you experience. Someone would replace a light fixture in a ceiling, cut out a great big giant hole, put in the light fixture little tiny light fixture and the air would just go up around it. So, and then uh, no insulation on the top of the second floor. And um, so it's just a two-story building and you can see that each of those rooms is duplicated on uh, above it with a, a matching room. And then the, the second story uh, ceiling doesn't really have any insulation, which we finally determined was because you didn't want to freeze the fire sprinklers, which had been added. So that was, that was a long discussion to try to figure out how to do that, and we have not fix that yet because if we put in insulation, we'll probably, probably cause our sprinklers to freeze. And so we've got five or six different ideas of how we're going to handle that, but it has not reached the stage where we want to uh, do that, spend that money. So it was really enlightening to see the, the uh, problems this, this has. Um, and one of the, the easier things we did was go around and seal all the single pane windows as best we could inside, but to try to go with that double pane on you know 300 plus windows and, and it just would not have made sense to spend that money when we needed to focus on what would make the guest happy first. So a lot of paint, a lot of uh, brand new landscaping. We built the sandbar restaurant, green gas. We built a Riverside Sandstone Terrace. None of these things were drawn when we first started or or even conceived. Um, but at the same time, we we reconditioned all 34 rooftop units. So in the common areas, we have rooftop units to 34 of them. Some we've replaced, which is great. But a lot of them we just reconditioned, and we got the economizers uh, cleaned up and working. And so I know those things are, are uh, paying benefits to the guest comfort as far as the airflow, things like that, that uh, has, has helped us a lot. So do you feel like you've really achieved the goal of, of keeping guest satisfaction at the forefront? It sounds like with the light quality and the light heat output and with the comfort level in the rooms through some of these, these changes to the rooftop units that you've definitely addressed the guest comfort. Yes. And this, this hotel suffered from out-of-state owners for 20 years, 20 plus years. And so we are now the local owners again. We have a long-term time frame. We've, we, since we took it over, we have had double-digit sales growth. So yes, people are coming and, and it has a lot to do with the comfort and the, the cleaning up and everything else that we've done in there and just great, great, great staff, by the way, um, which we were able to retain. So we didn't step in there and fire everybody, and we, we kept the staff. We've grown the staff. So we're really pleased with that. We, we think we can continue to go down the long-term path, but it may take us you know, five or seven years before we get to all those things on that list, which we wish we could do all at once. But some of them had you know, 3% return. Some of them had 20, those we took. Okay. Yeah, so it sounds like you've got your plan in place, and whether it takes five years, seven years, one year, or 20 years, you've got it down, and you know what your returns are going to be. Yes. That's the point. Okay. And how have you involved, I mean, you talked about the value of your staff. How have you involved staff and guests in some of these energy efficiency initiatives? So with the strategic plan, we assigned duties. So everybody turns out to have different talents than you think, um, which is great. So human resources is great at drawing maps. Um, so, you know, you, so everybody's got a, a, a job in there about uh, probably about eight or ten of us meeting on a monthly basis. Um, and we just 
kind of keep moving things along. Remember, also we're doing recycling and those sort of uh, green things too. So that that's being monitored with a green team, and um, and then every department head has meetings with their their staff on a regular basis uh, to kind of uh, follow up on things. I mean, you you can put out nice recycling. Uh, boxes and things like that, but someone from the kitchen then will throw a, a messy old thing in there, you know, so rinse, you know, and all the things you got to teach over and over again as far as uh, making it work. So can you give us any idea on um, any sort of rating changes in your guest approval ratings or any kind of energy savings, you know, any kind of concrete percentages or? Yeah, I can tell you that. So according to TripAdvisor, there are 56 hotels that are reported on TripAdvisor in uh, Boise. We were 38, number 38 when we bought it three years ago. We were now five and six, kind of hover in the five and six range. Um, so we, we drove it down pretty quickly. And uh, it's tough to beat those, the Hiltons. They're, you know, above you. So. Okay. Um, well, what about energy savings? Energy savings, I can tell you that because the occupancy has climbed, mm -hmm. it's, you're probably going to flash something up here that I'm not going to like. Um, <laughs> But I, I can have no statistics. Okay. Oh, good. Okay. And I'm free to talk. Um, but as a, a on a per occupied room, which is how you do it for a hotel, right? So your your low occupancy, you should have less energy use, although you've got very high just regular cost just to keep the building open. But on a per occupied room basis, we are finally starting to see these some numbers come down. So that's a combination of, of two things: increasing the sales. And, and decreasing the costs. Though I would have to say at this time, it's more keeping the cost the same and increasing the sales because we've had this pretty good growth, so we are going to be uh, sucking more power. Okay. Well, I mean, at this point, I think you've had a chance to tell your stories. Any any final thoughts or before I open it up to questions from everyone? Okay. Well, I wanted to open up to the room. You know, you've got. A 1910 building, a 1989 building, and a 1969 building that are different occupancies. One's a very mixed occupancy, one's very office, one's very hotel, and you know different processes for how they approach the changes. So, want to open it up to questions? He's got to be <laughs> uh, My question is for Kobe. Uh, you mentioned uh, working on the envelope. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit on what you did, uh, especially with the windows? Um, yeah, did you say you were an architect? Okay, so I'm going to pick on David for a minute here. Um, I'm not going to say which one of the integrated design lab staff told me this, but they said that the building uh, vents were designed by an architect and not by an engineer because they were the right size for the hole that was there. Not, not the right amount of air that needed to go out of the building. So, sorry. <laughs> sorry for that. Um, but, but really, that was, that was probably one of our, our biggest gains right off the bat, is literally we found out we were probably exhausting twice as much air, and, and we just got gravity dampers in there. So as you raise your static pressure, you know, it automatically exhausts more air. And we went through and we plugged half the holes around the building. Um, and it was amazing right off the bat. All of a sudden, our doors were blowing open. Um, we had all kinds of crazy new problems that we had to deal with because running the same same amount of fans, same amount of fan speeds, all of a sudden it changed what was happening in the building. Um, and we went in and, and reacted to those problems next, which you know, I mentioned before, two following, you, you fix one thing and all of a sudden you've got another problem. But after we reduced our fan speeds, you know, plugged a lot of the holes up, and like I mentioned before, we were running you know exhaust fans that we, we didn't need on all night for like the bathrooms. Uh, Closing up. Most of it was was designed into the building, and we just had to correct. You know, it it 89 doesn't seem like that long ago, but you can tell that the focus on energy and energy savings, you know, in the last 25 years it has really changed. And I think things that that were just acceptable in, in a building's design and, and in the envelope of a building 25 or 30 years ago just aren't now. Um, and, you know, I don't know if part of that's just with the ability to do, you know, like demand control ventilation and actually, you know, watch, you know, the makeup of your air compared to, you know, what we could do then. But it's, yeah, it was, it was almost all designed features that we blocked off or closed. 
um, that made the biggest difference. Um, yeah, um, we, we have another building. It's actually right across the street from it. It's you know about 250,000 square feet. And it was a building that was built in, I think it was completed in 75 or 76. And it's a, a single pane uh, building. Uh, it's a concrete structure. And, and it's actually one that we're looking at too. Um, and you know we're we're in the process of figuring out payback and you know what what commitment the owners want to make to that part of it. But um, with Wells Fargo, fortunately, that's one thing. You know the the quality of the glass, the quality of the windows was pretty good. Um, so we were able to leave those in Wells Fargo. But we do have other projects that we're actually considering um, either doing inserts or you know a reflective coating or something along those lines to help out. But uh, yeah, fortunately at Wells Fargo, that wasn't a a huge issue for us. So. Sure. Uh, just to piggyback on that thought before I ask my question, Nia, Nia has an initiative on sort of secondary glazing uh, systems, and they're doing uh, some research currently on two separate manufacturers at a lab at Berkeley, um, and doing uh, you know infiltration tests and thermal. Uh, conducting tests and whatnot on the performance of these various these kinds of films uh, uh, and secondary glazing units to add to existing buildings. So, um, as you're diving into that problem, we can maybe connect you with some of that information. But my question was for um, for David uh, Johnson on the Riverside, and you mentioned as is you know as makes a lot of sense picking off some of the higher return on investment projects first especially ones that double as an energy saver and as a uh, guest amenity uh, opportunity or guest thermal visual uh, comfort um, do you have a plan in place or how do you how do you imagine moving into t moving forward in time and tackling those projects that have lower ROIs any any ideas on how to uh, keep the pedal down, if you will, on uh, tackling these projects uh, as, as you get past that first wave of easier measures that also have the, the big guest amenity, um, and, and how, do the, how will you work through the economic decisions on, on that I, I get us asked that question by our team. Um, yeah, so we will continue to uh, increase the net operating income, and once we're at a, a certain net operating income, um, that is a defined goal. Uh, we will probably use some uh, capital financing, and we'll we'll leverage that uh, investment to make that make more sense. And it's just uh, the type of business is we had a, a pretty low cost coming into it that we we feel like uh, when it's normalized, it'll have a, a, a much higher appraised value and a much higher return on investment, and it'll make sense at that time to hit some of those really big ones. And um, we're, but we're so so looking at things right now because we have excess land that bring more people to the to the property, uh, different amenities such as the sandbar, and we're, we've got some other things that we're working on that'll just continue to. I, I really like the way it's uh, becoming somewhat urban down there with some wineries and breweries and arts and things like that, which kind of fits in with our style of of, of what we are there. So that's how we're going to do it. Is we we have a, a net operating income goal. When we get to there, we'll we'll make that next step. It probably won't be accumulated because they're so big. It probably won't be out of cash flow, and we'll just do something like that. That's pretty blunt, but that's the way. It's going. <laughs> yeah. Other questions? Do we have anything coming in online? you all off the hook that easy. Um, so Kobe, and really, yeah, I think maybe it's most directly relevant to a high-rise office building, but this, this whole concept of split incentives and uh, where, whereby the, the owner passes along the, the cost for purchasing energy to the tenants through a triple net or whatever leasing arrangement. You mentioned some green leasing strategies. I wonder, has is that 
have you wrestled with that problem at all? Are you thinking of ways in your leases that you're looking at in the future, try to address it, to set up sort of a more of a win-win for those who, the tenants who, who, so they would find a way to benefit from uh, the savings, energy savings as well? Or uh, is it not limited you yet on the projects that you want to implement? Um, you know, it, it, ha it has some. Um, more, more on the, I guess you, I would say the capital expenditure side. Um, you know, as far as, as items that we run through on operating costs, um, you know, really that's our operating costs or lack of high operating costs are part of what keep us competitive. Um, but energy is part of that. So, you know, it, it really works for you and against you. You know, you don't want to spend a whole bunch of money to improve things because it hurts your operating costs. But then as you make these improvements, you know, and you're, you're spending, buying less power, less natural gas, less whatever, you know, it actually makes you more competitive in the market. So it's kind of just, a, I, I guess, a balancing act of, of, you know, what makes sense, you know, what, you, you know, your return on investments are. But, you know, really, yeah, uh, you know, power, you know, it's, it all goes back to the tenant at the end of the day. Uh, you know, the lower operating costs you can keep, you know, the, the, the happier your tenants are. Um, so that's really, you know, our, our juggling act there and deciding, you know, what, what's an owner's expense, you know, that they're willing to do at their cost just to keep the building full and keep it, keep it leased, and, and what is actually kind of operating cost budget. The next question is uh, for Kobe and maybe David Johnson and uh, David Ruby, if you have some thoughts you can jump into, I guess. But it's uh, regarding lead for existing buildings, operation and maintenance, and, and whether uh, you've ever considered that, have you looked into it, uh, and uh, I'll leave it at that. Um, yeah, actually it's something that, that we started looking into. Um, to probably four or five years ago, um, and, and I guess a little bit of everything we do every year drives us in that direction. Our our initial goal is to get our Energy Star certification, and, and you know that that's a big step of your way to uh, the lead project. But a, a lot of the lead items are really becoming standard more more than you would realize. You know, something that 15 or 20 years ago, a building may or may not have a recycling program, for example. If you don't have it today, you're, you know, way behind the curve. Um, you know, and everything is that, that way, you know, from, from bicycle lockers and storage to, you know, showers in the building. And, I mean, it all is really becoming more industry standard. Um, so even if you don't realize you're working on it, you are, um, just to be competitive in the market. You know, I was going to ask maybe Sharon. I remember that Clay had talked early on in the project that uh, we were looking into lead for EV, and I I thought your name possibly came up, and I don't remember. Did, is there a tie there? Did you do anything on that when we started out? Do you recall? Um, I think there was initial what if yeah. kind of an idea, and, then, and, and that's it all it went very far. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there was just so many priorities that he had he had a lot of attention in a lot of different directions. Uh, that's so, that was sort of my kind of impression as well. I just sort of got washed over when we started uncovering bigger fires to put out. Um, but it's all, I think it's my understanding that LEED-EV can be applied for kind of at any time, as long as you haven't done anything too bad. But you're right. It's funny to think that just a few years ago, things we thought were pretty innovative, or, you know, which was probably the point, right, to get, to get that stuff out there so it's starting to happen everywhere. So Steve, should I push your question a step further and say, are any of you intending to do that? And then we'll ask David Johnson. Um, I, not that I know of, but um, you know, the tenant mix that I know that we are actually putting into the Hawaii so far has uh, been very proactive. And one of the, you know one of the reasons they're there is the energy efficient. Uh, the actually, the, I mean, the operable windows is a huge, it's a huge one. It's kind of funny, but people love that fact, um, and they. At least in this particular case, the building's so old, certain people are drawn to that, that may not want other things, and they're willing to sacrifice a little bit for some of that character. Um, yeah, I, I think the quick answer for us is, is yes. It's something we eventually you know, want to get to. Um, I actually, uh, this spring, you know, came across uh, an RFQ 
for a, a, a large tenant, I think it was like an 80,000 square foot tenant, that one of their um, requirements was that, you know, you would consider, you know, going after Lee EV at their request. So, I, I, again, I think it's becoming kind of an industry standard that, you know, for, for a competitive office building in today's market, you, you almost have to be moving that direction. Um, you know, I think it's what everybody wants, but it's really becoming industry standard. I think for us, uh, we do have the Energy Star rating as a goal in our long-term strategic plan. Um, but as far as getting that um, a, a lead, I, it's not really the goal. The goal right now would be the uh, lowering of the actual costs. Um, there used to be a lot of discussion in our industry five, ten years ago about how that would bring more customers. And it, I haven't really seen that yet. You know, we've got the recycling in the rooms, um, you know, little things like that. But you don't hear people complaining online if you don't have it, you know, in another hotel. So definitely on a new build, a new build hotel, I, I, I'd be all over that. So I think I think it would, if we ever do get to that point, it'll be because we've done all these other things that have gradually got us there. We've had two people asking all the questions, and I've asked way too many questions today, so I'm looking around the room. Does anyone else have a statement first? Okay, what's the online question? Yes. Um, and it's it's real simple. It's just I'm looking for a five year or less payback at this time. And if you looked in the integrated design labs work um, and and Leif's work too from site based energy, we we kind of identified those things that had that you know around that twenty percent return, so five year. And we've done some some studies with uh, uh, Ticker Engineering where it's two and a half percent return. I, you know that's so far out that we won't we can't consider that right now. I think my question is actually a relevant follow-up to that, and I appreciate all the honesty on the panel. It's it's uh, been fun to watch these projects uh, and participate in, at some level in them. The the David mentioned the break point, and I think we we know that every project reaches a break point, whether that's a new building or an existing building, whether it's a whole building gut or a sort of a surgical strike on a certain system to improve performance. Every project reaches this break point where oh, it's that five-year payback or it's, uh, gee, I'm not, I just don't have the, my gut feel that this is going to make a big enough difference to get that tenant to stay or to attract that new, that new uh, multifamily owner or whatnot. And I'm, I'm wondering if, we, if you'd be willing to talk a little bit about, can we talk about life cycle cost analysis and net present value and more complex uh, uh, calculations than a simple payback, but so often it, it does sort of come back to either a gut level decision about what we think we'll retain or won't retain a new a gain or a new tenant or an existing tenant or, or a simple payback number. And I'm wondering if each of your different models, if there are, if there are uh, uh, mechanisms by which we can make that connection to, that connection to sort of the real money, if you will, which is keeping a building full leasing it up and having a high uh, high uh, hotel occupancy rate. Um, are there ways to connect some of these projects to change the dynamics of those economic evaluations? Have you probed at them at all? Uh, would you like to probe at them at all? <laughs> I guess I have a thought um, early on. It, you know, a lot of discussion, the Hawaii in particular, um, and even Clay's role as the developer was there's a lot of emotion in that. I mean, he bought that to preserve it. You know, it literally was going to be torn down, or at least the, the thought had been mentioned. And when we were, you know, changing the lights from a higher quality to a less quality because we thought we had to, that, that was definitely something we weighed. I mean, what? And it wasn't necessarily like, will this tenant still be attracted? But it was almost like a, a kind of a civic pride thing, like. You don't want to get too close to that line where people are going to look at you and think, "What did you do to our thing?" You know, I, I, I guess at some level, I think we try to do that as architects with a lot of buildings. Like, you don't want to 
I mean, it's got to work. It's got a pencil, and we don't want to put too many holes that don't make sense into it. But you also, you know, you got to weigh that against, you know, what can you do to feel and and, and still feel that you did your best job with it. Where, where's that line? And within it, well, the build. I know the why he was every time we did something like that when we knew X amount just got eaten something that no one ever see, but what else can you do? And in that case, we did reach the point where, okay, it's, money's gone. We're still, we're not there. And we had, to, the ownership had to go back and find more because we had to do it. We felt if we if we went down the path that the numbers are telling us to go down, the building won't be attractive. It'll, the asset's going to be less valuable than it could be and should be. And that's where that extremely long-term approach of, this isn't five years. This is could be twenty or thirty on a build. So a building like that was pretty unique. When you have something that old, you just can't replace it, and there's so few. I think um, kind of my response on that, at least for the buildings that I deal with, is I love looking at the life cycle, life cycle, life cycle, life cycle. I, I love it when a piece of equipment gets old enough that I can justify replacing it because I can get a newer, bigger, better. Uh, more efficient, and and that's that's really where I, I make a lot of my focus. It's it's um, you know commercial office building. The whole idea of the building is is it's it's got to make money. It's an investment, um, and and for the guys that, that own it and run it, that number doesn't come in black at the end of the year. I'm in trouble, you know. So it's it, it's just a great opportunity to say you know what we've got to dump the money into this piece of equipment anyway. And, and so instead of just going out and and buying the the new replacement off the shelf, so to speak. Um, spend some time ahead of time. Say, okay, what's coming up? You know, I mean, I know in my future, in the next ten years, I'm looking at doing a roof on a building. That, that's a huge, you know, huge expense to start out with. But now you're talking, okay, you know, what kind of insulation can we do? What kind of reflective, you know, value can we get on it? And, and so it's really, I think, thinking of these improvements ahead of time. So as you know, they're coming up. Doing the planning to where you're ready. You know exactly what you want. And it, it's really kind of a, you know, I mean, it's. I guess over the last you know five years, it's really changed how I look at things. It's almost a puzzle that you're putting together. So when that time gets here, you're like, oh yeah, I get to get that new, you know, bigger, better, whatever it is that's going to help the efficiency of the building. That's going to help the comfort of the tenants. That's going to help the payback over the long range. Um, so yeah, for me, it's life cycle. So. For us, um, I call our operations office officer and I say, "What broke today?" That's how I start the conversation and. Um, so, I can give you a you know specific example though of, of reaching a, a breaking point. So you all are very familiar with key cards that go into the lock locks of, of hotel rooms, and um, so 300 hotel rooms and uh, say a new system is going to be $300 per key. That you got $90,000 to spend. So what happened the other day was the chief engineer came up to me and said the brains of these locks now to replace them are $290 each and they're going to stop making them. And the new technology is the infrared, you know, the little one you just touch and it, the door opens and they're only $185 each. By the way, we can throw in $70 for uh, energy communications at the front desk. By this. So it all, the technology came around that we're reaching the breaking point and going to be replacing all our keys for that reason. So there's probably time for one more quick question, so I just want to give everyone an opportunity for that. Okay. Well, I think with that, I'll say thank you. you know, I appreciate the perspective of, of each of you on our panel and providing us with different examples of how you've approached energy efficiency um, in projects that have ranged from you know, long-term operation of a hotel, long-term operation of an office building, and you know, a historic building that we looked at a, a pretty short-term renovation of to give it a sense of place and to keep that historic value but still incorporate energy efficiency. So and thank you to everybody here for some good questions and appreciate you being here today. Hope to see you next uh, next fall series. Thanks.